Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the historic Pythian Theater for the 13th Annual Legends and Legacies Award Ceremony. Please welcome to the stage the Executive Director of the King Arts Complex, Ms. Demetrius Neely. Thank you very much. Welcome to the King Arts Complex where dreams come alive. And thank you so much for joining us this evening for the 2019 Legends and Legacies Award Ceremony honoring Mr. Kurt Moody and Mr. Lewis Smoot. They are so deserving. Yes. They are extraordinary individuals. They are giants in their indus individual industries. And they are benefactors and friends of the King Arts Complex. They are virtually building the skyline of the city of Columbus, building and designing the skyline of the city of Columbus, as well as building and des designing the skyline of many cities across America. They are truly legends, and we are delighted to honor them this evening. Now, if it's not clear to you why we chose them as our legends this year, just pay attention to the program, because as the program becomes nearer, you will clearly see why they are deserving of this year's honor. At this time, please help me welcome to the stage our board chair, Ms. Olivia, jo Ms. Olivia Johnson. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Board of Trustees of the King Arts Complex, welcome to the 13th Annual Legacies and Legends Ceremony. Could the Board of the King Arts Complex please stand at this time and be recognized? Thank you. Tonight, we are excited to honor Curtis Moody, Jr. and Louis Smoot, Jr. We honor them for their outstanding contributions to civil rights and for continuing Dr. King's legacy of justice for all. We also thank them for all of their past, current, and future support of the King Arts Complex. Before we begin our recognition of these two, uh, two distinguished honorees, we wish to thank our sponsors. First, join me in thanking our honorary co-chairs, Mindy and Mark Corner, Dan, thank you, Dan Moncrief III, Jane and Bob White. We also thank the Legends and Legacies House Committee, whose names are listed in the program and are scrolling on the screen behind me. We also thank our corporate sponsors, presenting sponsor, our Legends and Legacies House Committee, premier sponsor, L Brands Foundation, Platinum Sponsor, AEP, Smooth Construction, Turner Construction, Diamond Sponsors, Elford Construction, Honda, Huntington Bank, Moody Nolan, The Ohio State University, Park National Bank, and our media sponsor, Columbus Business First. In addition, there are a host of gold sponsors and event sponsors who have supported tonight's event. They are listed in the program and are recognized on the rolling screen. And we wish to welcome Mr. Michael Russell, CEO of the Atlanta-based H.J. Russell and Company, who traveled here tonight from Atlanta to honor his two friends. H.J. Russell and Company is one of the largest African-American-owned construction companies in the U.S. 
please join me in thanking all of these wonderful sponsors. As a matter of fact, we would like for all of our House Committee and our co-chairs to please stand at this time so we can all see you. And you also, Mr. Russell, please stand. We also have uh, elected officials who are with us tonight, so would all elected officials stand at this time and be recognized? Thank you very much. We appreciate your support and your attendance with us tonight. Well, we're nearing our program and before our honorees come to the stage, it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Jerry Revish, our moderator for the evening. Jerry, are you here? I am. <laughs> I am. Hi, Jerry. Hey. <laughs> Mr. Revish is the news anchor of WBNS TV 10, or 10 TV. 10 TV. Hi, Jerry. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, a great honor to be here with you again, my fourth consecutive time being here for this program. Uh, thank you all for joining us in the historic Pythian Theater that will celebrate its 94th anniversary in January 2020. I believe that deserves a round of applause. 94 years. 94 years. Legends and Legacies recognizes the rich and diverse contributions of individuals who have shown their commitment to human rights, artistic excellence, and service. Their actions have influenced and impacted their community, city, state, and nation through philanthropy, service, leadership, creativity, and vision. Throughout the evening, you will learn more about their storied careers, and it will become quite obvious why they were selected as the 2019 Legends and Legacies honorees. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke these words about excellence. If a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted or Beethoven composed music or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. I think it's safe to say tonight's honorees exemplify these words and they are inspiring others to serve as they lead by example. Before we bring our honorees and moderator to the stage tonight, please direct your attention to the screen here. There are some people who would like to recognize our honorees, so enjoy. I can think of no two better icons in the business and civic environment that deserves this great award more than Lewis Smoot and Kurt Moody. Prince of Pioneer. Kurt is just a very creative person. I mean, he, he sees things that other people don't see. He has helped shape this city as a designer and architect unlike anyone else. He's tenacious. He doesn't take no for an answer. He believes in quality. He sets a great example for, uh, for other minority firms uh, in, in, in the country. I have known Kurt to be a good person. His spirit, his heart towards the African American community, but also he's a visionary architect. Only the largest African American architectural firm in and of itself is an achievement. But they didn't get there because they're African-American. That firm got there because they do better work than anyone else. That, to me, is the sign of great leadership. It makes Columbus proud to have, to have the largest minority architecture firm in the United States in our city. Some people talk, and some people do. Kurt does. When I think about Kurt, I think about a friend. I think about someone who's a hard worker, someone who jumps over any hurdle 
and looks back and says, I'll take you with me. He's just that kind of guy. I don't have that creative, brilliant mind where you can look at something and imagine what it could be and then draw that out and make it reality. That's what he does. And that's unique and cool and special. This guy is the real deal. Louis Smoot is an icon in this city and around the nation. When he thinks about things, he is so considered, he's so passionate. Everybody comes to him. Everyone comes to him, and rightly so. He always put everyone else before himself and does not like the recognition. Uh, it's like under the radar, so to speak, because um, that's just the way he is. He would rather not have his name out there. He would rather be able to stand outside of the limelight. And he always says, uh, the people that need to know, know. And I want to thank him for being Mr. Smoot. He took his company from his father and formed it and shaped it to be one of the largest minority-owned construction companies in the entire nation. Senior shows that you can start in the hills of West Virginia, come to Columbus, establish a business, do it in a first-class way that carries throughout the country. Uh, and reputationally, there's just nothing that I can say that would better represent what someone should do than Lewis Smoot Sr.'s name. I think some people call Sr. Um, the godfather of construction. He has given a lot of people a lot of opportunities. He is one of the uh, type of people who, who doesn't want anybody to know that he's doing things. He's kind of a hidden entity behind the scenes, but I know he's engaged in the community and uh, is very much a benefactor of the community. He's done a terrific job of, of operating with all kinds of integrity from, from Columbus. He's a household name in Washington, D.C. He has buildings all over the country. It is who we all look up to as the man that has set a vision for us all. He's given an equal commitment to the community in investing in the community and giving back. There are a lot of company-made men and women. There are very few men and women that, who have made companies. Louis Smoot is one of those individuals who has made uh, a company and made a community and raised a family. What treasures we have among us tonight. How about a round of applause for that video? Thank you all involved with that. I think the testimonies we just witnessed make it very clear why we are honoring these two gentlemen. They are etching their journeys onto the pages of history. And at this time, we introduce our 2019 Legends and Legacies honorees. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Curtis Moody, Sr., CEO, Moody Nolan. And you might as well remain standing. Mr. Lewis Smoot, Sr., Chairman, Smoot Construction. And our moderator for tonight's fireside chat is Mr. Mark Corna. He retired as CEO of Corna Kokosing in 2016 after working in the construction industry for 49 years. Mark began his career as a carpenter and started his own company in 1976. He is one of this year's Legends and Legacies Host Committee co-chairs and past chair of the King Arts Complex Board of Trustees. Please give a warm welcome to Mark Corna.
Well, Lewis and Kurt, congratulations on this well-deserved recognition. You two truly are legends in the construction and design industry, and it's a real honor for me to be on this stage with you tonight. So, Lewis, let's uh, begin at the beginning. Would you please share with us the history of your company, how and where it began, all the way back to your father and uncle starting a masonry company in West Virginia, and tell us how you built it into the impressive enterprise that it is today. Let's go back. To, can you hear me? Let's go back uh, to my parents and to the Smoot family in a place called Boone County, West Virginia. The year was 1927. <laughs> I said, our family back into our county. Uh, did you hear that? <laughs> okay. What I was trying to say is uh, take us back to the Smoot group, the Smoot family in Boone County, West Virginia. The year was 1927 when we were having our first reunion on the sacred ground of four generations, including the slave that was on that uh, ground. It's, it's hard sometimes to reflect back on that, but it's something that we have to do and we do it frequently and I'd like to get this out. This year was our 91st consecutive reunion. There were 400 people that over the three days of food, church, and seeing your cousins and family from different parts of the world including Japan. It was an enjoyable evening. But let's get to what it brought with my father. It was always in his mind that you treated people like you re wanted to be treated. And that was in the case of his family. But during those years, we all know there were years it was something called segregation. And when they finished school, as it was for them in Boone County, West Virginia, eighth grade was as far as he got, because that was as far as he was allowed to get. But he, through a boat and hopping a train, continued his education at what is now known as West Virginia State University. And they, the four brothers became bricklayers at that particular time. And they continued that, and it was then interrupted by the war, which tore the company apart. Our father came back after the war, and serving in the Pacific on a rescue boat. And he restarted the company on January the 1st, 1946. And I said, Dad, 46, I understand, but what's this on January the 1st? It's a holiday. He said, it isn't a holiday. If you gotta work, you gotta work. <laughs> and so that was one of his sayings. And to this day, we all go to the office and put in at least four hours <laughs> for my dad. <laughs> yeah. But during that period of time, he and his brothers in starting the company was called Smooth Brothers. On Sunday evening, they would load up their car or cars, put what is known as mortar boxes on top of the car, and the four of them with their father, who back then, we had no machinery, used to, those of you know, mix the mud so they could lay the brick or the block. They traveled as far as Florida, Maryland, the 
District of Columbia and Virginia to find work because work was not readily available here again during to the times of those, shall we call other conditions. But when he came back from the military, he started the Sherman R. Smoot Company. While he was gone, my mother saved $300. And that's what started the company. That's what he started with, $300. You know, today people say, well, I got to get money. You got to get it if you work for it. And you have to give back. And you have to do all those things that you hear about here in Columbus, Ohio. But dad began to grow the company with his brothers and finally broke in to where the unions would allow him to call himself a bricklayer. He did it so well, if you fast forward today, we're known for our quality of work. The brothers passed on and we continued to work. Dad called to the military, Lewis, Called to the military. <laughs> yeah, with friends and neighbors that I never knew. <laughs> you know, uh, pardon me. I don't, I, it's hard for me to get used to this. They used to tell me that I talk too loud. Uh, but anyhow, uh, Dad did his share of work within the uh, armed forces. I did mine. Lewis Jr. did his. Because he believed even back then, you give back to that which has been given to you. We're very, very blessed to have offices in three locations. We have people here in the audience that are part of our team. Not team, but party. Part of our family. Because we don't look at what the Spoot Company did and I did not build the business as some people think I did, and neither did my dad alone. We consider the people that work with us as our friends, as our neighbors, as part of our family. And that has propelled us to get to the point that we are today. Time would not allow me to tell you everything that my dad did. But he was a man that looked at you, and if you'd ask him, Sherman, what do you think I ought to do? What's the best advice that you can give me? He said, do your job, do it well, and do it in the right time. And he said, get paid. <laughs> He also said, when you get paid, don't forget you have some payables. <laughs> and that's the reputation that we carry today. Because when he was headed to the military, he went down and paid off his bills at something called Commerce Bank in Charleston, West Virginia, where he was headquartered. And when he got out of the military, they offered him a line of credit which nobody else would do. And they sent him over to a place called Carson Insurance Agency that gave him the bond that he needed and the insurance. Car uh, the bank is no longer there. I think it was purchased by Huntington. But that company that I'm talking about who gave us the bonds and the insurance is still our broker today. That was from 1946 to the day. People, and the advice is, is when you ask somebody to treat you well, you treat you, them well, you become friend, friends, and it's a little easier to get a loan and a little easier to get bonded by doing what is right. My dad was one who said, don't forget, if you owe a man a dollar, pay it. If you, he owes you a dollar, collect it. I 
I repeat, I have to keep repeating that. But at the end of the day, they didn't have to get in that car anymore. And he chose, he chose Columbus, Ohio as a place that it would be good for his family and for the children. He's very high, he was very high on making sure that the children got educated and made something of themselves and helped take care of their neighbors. And my dad was just like that. And I think all of us in the family copy that. The biggest problem we have today is some people don't even know their neighbor. When I was growing up, my mother made me cut my la uh, the neighbor's grass. And you know that little thing called the uh, curb? I thought I was through one day and she said, go down and sweep along the curb. You don't want anybody to see dirt in front of your house. But it was just that type of upbringing we had. And I think I've talked enough about that. You, pro <laughs> you probably know that uh, you wanted something else. I get started and I can't start. Well, what your father and uncle accomplished in a time and place that was not always friendly to black folks is truly incredible. And what you have uh, accomplished to transform that masonry subcontractor into the enterprise that it is today is also incredible. So, Kurt, you were a uh, star basketball player at Columbus North High School. You were even mentioned in Will Haygood's book, Tigerland. You then went on to play for the Ohio State basketball team when you were in the architecture program there. Architecture is a very challenging subject to pursue due to all of the time required for design studios. Playing a Division I sport is also very time consuming with all of the workouts, practices, and travel. You played basketball at Ohio State and secured your degree in architecture. What was it like trying to balance these two? Well, definitely it was a, a challenge. Um, one of the things that happened when I was in uh, high school, I, I played multiple sports. So uh, I had scholarships in um, basketball, football, and track, and um, two schools that didn't teach architecture. <laughs> uh, I had no offers from any school that taught architecture, and I knew that I wanted to do that. So I asked my coach if he would call, at the time, Fred Taylor at Ohio State and uh, allowed me to come out for the team. Uh, they agreed, uh, and at that time, freshmen could not play varsity. It was you had a freshman team, and then you had a varsity team. Uh, so I made the freshman team, and it just ha so happened it was the best recruiting year uh, that Ohio State had ever had. It was the first seven-foot center, Luke Witte, uh, and uh, multiple All-State players and it was, uh, the thought was you had, uh, I had no chance to uh, make varsity the next year. Um, but I was fortunate, I persevered, I made varsity and uh, then uh, won a grant uh, to, to play. Uh, my, <clears throat> my professor in architecture uh, said, no way, <laughs> give it up. <laughs> you cannot be an architect and, and play basketball they don't, those two things don't go together. You have too much time you need in the studio, and if you can't dedicate yourself to be an ar architect, then you don't need to practice this profession. Uh, he actually went to uh, a number of my, uh, or that professor, uh, he was my advisor, uh, said, you know, you, you need to give it up, and I said, I'm here for a short period of time, you don't get any younger. <laughs> if I'm gonna play, I'm gonna have to play now. I can't come back after school and graduate and then go play basketball. So uh, I, I stuck it out. Uh, I will say it was very, very tough uh, because architecture is different than most other curriculums in that uh, the hours that you have, like if you need 18 class hours per, at the time it was per quarter, not semester, you take about 25 hours worth of class. Um, studio, matter of fact, it was more than that, it was closer to 30, because five hours of class for an architectural student in a studio was three hours a day, five days a week, 15 hours a week uh, to have five hours credit. And then other courses were the same. 
And so to get to practice from studio, uh, I had to, uh, I had to become very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Not just running. <laughs> uh, but here's what it did, uh, quite frankly, I didn't know it at the time. When all the other students were suffering with 15 different concepts to design a building, I knew I didn't have time to do that because I had to get to practice. So I found a way to narrow the concepts quicker and get to the best concept I could within a shorter period of time. And it just so happened that the architect's exam, the way it works is you have we had a 12-hour exam for a design problem. And everybody complained that they could not finish the design problem within the time that was provided. Except me, I finished early and, and passed the exam. <laughs> but uh, that was just because, you know, you, you have to do what you have to do, and uh, I learned to do that, and it, it's followed me since then. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, like, like in the School of Architecture, uh, that was not a good thing as far as our, my professors went. They did not uh, like that, uh, but uh, I'm glad I did it. We can all probably assume that you uh, learned to function on very little sleep during that time. That's true. That's true. <laughs> we had, uh, as you know, in an architecture class, you, when, you have a, when you have a project you turn in at the end of the week, all they want you to do is turn it in at the end of the week. How much time it takes is up to you. And most times, uh, we're all noted for pizza late at, in the studio, all-nighters, especially the day before it's due and you don't have any sleep, and then you rush to practice <laughs> the next day. So that was just part of the lifestyle. Lewis, you gave us some background on the history of your company. Uh, tell us about what your first jobs were and uh, your memories of that. And you hinted on uh, what your father has taught you over time. Uh, what most resonates in the lessons that you learned from your father besides getting paid? <laughs> as far as, as my career, I think if I, I would be best served by talking after I came out of the military uh, and called Dad and told him I'd landed and was here, and he said, hurry up, I got a hospital to build, and I need you there. Uh, so that was the beginning of it. And when I started in that, it didn't take us long to graduate to the extent that we were doing larger buildings. We had opportunities, pardon me for using names, but Turner Construction Company was very helpful to us, and Gilbane Building Company, uh, to name two. And we started with them doing joint ventures. And it, it really worked out very well for us and enabled us to see what the whole concept of construction was all about. And I made it up in my mind at that particular time, which was in 1978, that we wanted to go from masonry business to the general contracting field. Uh, I went to Dad and asked Dad, I said, Dad, you didn't send me, pardon me guys, but I gotta say it, I, I went to Michigan State, but I, we build buildings at Ohio State, and I, I haven't been back there since then. <laughs> but I did told him, I said, you didn't send me to Michigan State uh, just to continue to lay brick. And he just said, what the hell took you so long to figure it out, do what you wanna do. <laughs> so that's when we began, and there was something called the 8A program, that you had opportunities up and coming, young contractors, contractors and minority contractors, women, et cetera. And I went in that program and I made, I made sure that I didn't stay too long because if you stayed, there was a limit put on what you could do. Uh, we graduated in three years rather than five and began to do these different types of jobs like Gil Bain called me and uh, I was at that hospital in Steubenville 
and they said, uh, we'd like for you to come and work with us at the College of uh, Steubenville and uh, build some dormitories. And we did that. And we work with them till this day. And a lot of times, it's hard to understand. Mr. Russell here doesn't understand because he does the same thing that we do in, in a different fashion. But anyhow, they, they told me after I did that job, he said, you got, you, you got more talent than that. You need to look at general contract. And I already was. And uh, looking at him, too, because today there's a job in Washington, D.C., out of our Washington office with, Mike, uh, with Mark uh, that is a 50-50 job, and we're in the lead, not them. So we learn very well. And with Turner, we continue to do work here and other things. I usually don't mention those things because I don't want to step on anybody's toes. But Turner was the one that told me, said, there's more under your hard hat than just masonry, and I'm going to help you get it. They did that. Um, that's been part of my career. Part of my career. Uh, I think the important part, as I started early, or looking on who's going to follow me. And I knew Mark was there, Lewis was there, and there were others. And there are people that come to work with us that they bring their wife, and they work, and they bring their daughters or their sons, and they work. We are very responsive to people that are going to school to make sure they make that tuition and not a loan when they go back. And uh, it began to work for us, and it wasn't very long before I was leading that. But leaders are made up of more than just someone like me and Kurt. We, we, we think of things, and sometimes they come to us and say, are you crazy? And I remember one job we did at Ohio State, and I don't know if Greg Palmer's here or not, but I was teasing him. We were uh, bidding this job, and we just won one job over there. And I said, we can't get another job. He said, you want to bet? And he said, we can get it if we have the right price and if we have the right proposal. We got the job. So it's, you, you can't tell the best thing you can do is do the best you can in writing that proposal and turning it in. And that's what we learned to do. So we're about quality. And, and we have an acronym called CHIP that we drive our company by. And uh, Mark and his folks have been able to make a little coin and it stands for character, character, humility, integrity, pride, and performance. And we're known because of our honesty, our integrity, and we're not going to take a nickel from anybody. We're going to try to get the job done as economically as we can. But that has been delivered. That's the smooth organization and everybody in there seems to be doing the same thing. And when I'm here tonight, like accepting this, this is accepted by the 155 people that we got. I didn't do it. They did it. Kurt, your firm has grown from a small practice in Columbus to the largest African-American owned architectural firm in the United States. And even more impressively, according to the latest survey in architectural record, the 49th largest architectural firm overall in the United States. And folks, to put that in perspective, according to the American Institute of Architects, there are approximately 17,500 architectural firms in the United States. So please share with us how this uh, phenomenal growth of your firm happened. Prayer. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of prayer. <laughs> uh, I, I absolutely uh, follow uh, Lewis's, uh, uh, his vision. Uh, it's people. It's, uh, you know, uh, 
one thing I learned in athletics uh, is teamwork. Uh, it, it absolutely, uh, for me personally, uh, I felt that my background in athletics helped me tremendously in business uh, because I always played on teams coming up and found that when we won, it wasn't, even though you might have a leading scorer uh, in basketball, a leading scorer needed somebody to get the ball to him. Uh, leading scorer needed somebody to rebound. Leading scorer needed somebody to defend. So everybody had a part. And I, I just took that to the business and said, you know, I'm not going to be the superstar when it comes to everything we do. That I've got to find people who have more talent than I do in areas that I have weakness and then try to help those people get better uh, as well. So, uh, you know, we have a, I'm fortunate, uh, we have a very, very talented uh, firm today, more so than we ever were. And, uh, and those people uh, that uh, surround me uh, really create a situation that allows us to compete. Uh, it is not easy in today's market, even, even though uh, we have size, we have you know, history, we have you know, experience, but that's not the only thing that wins projects these days uh, across the nation. We still go into areas, and I've been in the deep south <laughs> where uh, they did not believe that our firm did the work that we told them we did. Because in the South, most minority firms were in support. It was uh, a large firm would bring a minority firm or female-owned firm as, as a percentage participant. And never, and not ever, but in some cases, they were not the lead firm. And we would go in uh, asking, you know, with our experience, that we had the reputation to, to, to be the lead. Well, uh, I was in an interview, this is a quick story, I was in an interview in Mississippi, and I was with uh, another firm who was, and, and uh, a majority on all white firm, who invited us to be on their team because they were going after a project at historically black college, but they were funded by the Board of Regents. Uh, and then that fund, the firm that we were teamed with had gone in, they had no minority employees, and so they said, the school was asking whether or not we could have some staff members that look like them. Uh, on, and we said, we don't, but we'll find a firm to team with, and they brought us in as the lead designer for, for the project. And we went to the interview, and there were six uh, Board of Regents members that were all white, um, and one person from the school, which was an uh, African-American female. And I was presenting our qualifications, and the chairman stopped the interview and says, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mr. Moody, did you really do those projects? <laughs> and I, you know, I paused for a second and said, yes, these are all our projects. These are all projects we were the lead firm on. Now, we won the project, uh, but it was just that fact that that individual did not take my word for it. And that is part of the challenge that we face in growth. And even in 2019, there are areas we pursue projects in uh, this country that uh, we can't, we're, we're, we're somewhat pioneers. We go in and they're not, haven't seen a firm like us and it's harder for them to accept that we can do what our peers can do. And uh, so uh, what I found is try to find the good in, in whatever bad situation. And so what it does for me is say, I've got to compete harder. We've got to just work harder. We've got we to go after the project harder. And, and we've got to leave no doubt, if possible, that we're the firm that should move forward. And that's what has fueled our growth.
Lewis, your uh, headquarters are in Columbus, but you also have offices in Indianapolis and Washington, D.C.s, and you've uh, teamed up with some of the leading contractors in those cities to be, build some of the uh, most important buildings in those cities. Can you share with us how those partnerships came about and tell us a little bit about some of the uh, highlights of projects you've built in those two cities? Well, uh, let's forget the mic. <laughs> the mic. I'm, I'm going to dream about it. Um, I'll start here in Columbus and there's an old saying in the construction business, the best project that you have is the one you just got. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, here in Columbus, there's a lot of them. And uh, one wouldn't really describe what it was. But I think the two that we look at that we enjoy and continue to enjoy is the remodeling of the State House. It's a six year project. Uh, that building was a mess. Kurt was involved. We were involved. We were the construction manager for it. Um, the other thing is the union at Ohio State that Kurt and I have been involved in, and we did that together. And I think if you look in your little book, you'll find about 25 or 30 projects that we have done collectively. And uh, we get a chance to try to sell each other, but sometimes uh, they can't think that the two of us could possibly do that much work. Uh, in, in Indianapolis, uh, I'm going to use a name, and I have to use these names because here again, as I told you, it's not always about me. When we went to uh, Washington, D.C., I got a call from Gil Bain saying, I want you to come to uh, 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 Washington and uh, do some work for General Electric. And I said, where is it? They told me where it was and everything. And my dad and I flew over there. And I said, why are you calling me? Why are you? And I knew Gilbane very well. I said, why did you just call me? I'm all the way up in Columbus. He said, we needed the work done fast. We needed a good looking job, and we knew you would man it some kind of way. And we went down there and we did that job for them. And as a result of that, that's what opened the office in Washington, D.C. And when you talk about Washington, everybody knows we both have been involved with the uh, museum, the African American Museum, the, and we talk about the things that we've done there. We've done five projects on the mall and um, the uh, dome of the, uh, the gold in the dome, such as it is, um, when, when you were seeing that uh, being remodeled and redone in Washington, we were doing the top of it, the gold part of it, and Turner was doing the other part of it, another case of where we work together with people and do that. And uh, from there, we uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Indianapolis. Um, in Indianapolis, I was called by a guy in this town, and I'm going to use a different way of introducing him. He was a guy that would come and say, hey, man, I got something that you need to know. <laughs> I said, what is it? He said, you buy me dinner and maybe we drink a little wine. I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> you all know who that was, none other than Warren Tyler. And Warren was working for Steve Goldsmith at that time. And he said, come on over there, I've got a uh, large project that they want somebody to manage and make it go right. And we went to Indianapolis and we're still there as a result of that. And that was some um, almost 25 years ago. Uh, to move around like that, it takes people and good people. And we have people who have trained here in Columbus and been able to go out on their own 
and do that and represent the values that we think we have and are taking to other places. Uh, in that city, the one that we like was the uh, airport, the stadium, and we did we did a, we just did a lot of work over there. There's one other thing we did, and that was we increased their minority participation rates by working with their people from three percent to eighteen percent across the board. Some, some people think it's a hard thing to do. I have a lady sitting in the audience here that has ability to take care of that. It's like having another mother that whips you every day if you don't do what's right. And uh, it was just a matter of developing program such that you can teach people at an elementary level before they go to the college level. All of our people do that, and it's a continued thing that we've done. And uh, the people in the organization, and Lewis Jr. headed that up, and still is responsible for part of it. Um, I get off, pardon me, I get off and it's all running together, and this thing doesn't help it. You've earned the right. Kurt, you were the architect. Lewis, you were the contractor on the King Arts Complex project. What memories do you have of this project? Memories I have is uh, and I kind of go to a situation that we talked about some time ago. Um, when this uh, building was being, uh, uh, the King Center was formerly uh, the headquarters of the Masons, and uh, um, Jerry Hammond at the time determined that it needed to be a tribute, and there was the idea of naming a street, there was the idea of a building, it became uh, uh, the desire to name the building and, and do the renovation. Uh, we were fortunate that, that at the time we were small firms, uh, and uh, we were fortunate to uh, uh, to be selected uh, to do, do design work, but the problem we had was this is not a, a building, it wasn't designed as a theater, it was designed as a movie house. And that front there, in the depth where that screen is, is about the, that's how deep the stage is. And most major theaters have a very deep stage so they can have what's called wing space to have people come in from the wings and be able to go back behind the curtain, back and forth. This didn't have that. And so, but it, everybody wanted it to be a theater. So as you see, this stage is out toward the seating. This is called a thrust stage. And the seating originally was up to about where we sit. So we had to remove seating uh, in order to and design a stage that was called a thrust stage and then all the lighting we pulled out in order to make it a performing stage as, as adequate as it could be. And uh, so uh, for us, uh, that was a big challenge because we had not done a theater uh, like this before. Uh, and uh, so we did a lot of research and came up with a way to do this and uh, we're very fortunate that uh, as, as you know, Lewis's uh, team uh, was also selected as the builder, so when we worked together with them, uh, we were able to put a lot of energy into restoring this building in, a, in as positive a way as possible. But it was limited funds based on the budget at the time, very limited. So it was, it was definitely a great experience for us, and, and we uh, uh, still to this day are very prideful of having been involved. Any thoughts on it, uh, Lewis? Any thoughts on this project? I don't know if this is appropriate, appropriate or not, but uh, we also were responsible for going out into the community and putting people in the community in touch with what was going on here to raise funds for it. We were very successful. Uh, the Wolf family, the Wexner family, and a guy named Jerry Hammond 
And those of you that knew Jerry knew that when he told you to do something, you better do it. And uh, so we worked with him on that, and that helped with the budget. Uh, I think that's... Well, that, that segues into my next question. Uh, Les Wexner and John Fisher were the two founding spot, uh, supporters of the King Arts Complex. And you were both involved when Les called together the leaders from the African American community and invited you, that's a nice way to put it, mm -hmm. to contribute to the startup of the King Arts Complex. Can you guys tell us a little bit about that experience? Yeah. Uh, yeah this is, for us, it was quite interesting. Um, we were invited to a breakfast, and at the time, someone didn't tell us, we didn't get the message that it was a fundraising breakfast. Uh, we got the message, we were the architect, we needed to be there, and we thought uh, we we're going to have a good breakfast. <laughs> so anyway, the room was, uh, you know, in Les's house in Bexley, and uh, uh, there was a bunch of people in the room, and we were all moving around, and... Uh, and, and his rabbi came down and said, we believe that when you're looking, when you're asking for money, and, and by the Jewish tradition, you yourself, you first step up yourself. And, uh, and they said, less is going to match any money raised in this room today. So whatever you raise, He's going to match. He's going to write a check for it today. So they started going around the room asking, how much are you going to <laughs> contribute? And Howard and I, Howard Nolan at the time, Howard and I, he was on the opposite side of the room, and I couldn't get up to go see him <laughs> because of the way we were sit seated. So... Uh, they're going around and, for instance, Jerry Hammond, they got to Jerry and he said $1,000 and all that. We, well, we were having trouble making payroll at the time. <clears throat> so Howard was across the room and Howard's seeing, he, they're coming to him to ask him and he's got to speak for the firm. He's got to say, Moody Nolan's, you know, and I said, oh no, you know, this is going to be a problem. So, so Howard says, He's, he's not wanting to yell out, he says, you know, and I said, I held my hand real, you know, 5,000, 5,000, you know, I'm thinking 5,000, and that's, that's, and that's stretching it, I'm telling you. So Howard says, he says, $10,000. <laughs> and, and by the time he said that, I mean, it was too late. <laughs> So, so anyway, that was the, at the, that was a ten thousand dollar breakfast, uh, <laughs> at that time. Uh, Lewis, I think uh, Les got a little more personal with you. You want to tell about that? Les and Jerry. Jerry. <laughs> Les and uh, Jerry called me. I was in the Washington office, and they said, "Got something you need to do." You need to come back, get together. We're going to have a breakfast at Les's house. I said, that's fine. And he said, we're going to teach you how to raise money. <laughs> so, and I said, I understand that. And he said, well, how much are you going to put in? And I said, well, what do you want me to put in? And he said, well, he said, I think you ought to put in about $15,000. So I'm trying to figure out, normally contractors will say, I'm going to get that on my next change order from somebody else. So, you know, you know the there, people, there are, the people that I had on the phone, I wouldn't want to say no to them. Um, so we talked about the breakfast, and he said, Les then started telling people what he wanted to have. And he said, now there's Lewis down there. He's going to give us $30,000. <laughs> The breakfast, all, the breakfast all came back. <laughs> all right. uh, I think that it was the right thing to do, and I think that's why we do those things collectively and individually in the community today, because we're very blessed, and our responsibility is to pass the blessing on. Uh, 
again, congratulations, and you do have uh, not only been icons in the community, but also from the get-go supporters of the King Arts Complex and continue to do so, and everyone is very grateful for your uh, contributions. Now we'd like to uh, call to the podium uh, Mark Kane from Smoot uh, Construction, who is the president, to say a few words about Lewis. I've got to do this and make sure I get paid tomorrow as well. <laughs> we can all agree that Lewis Sr. is a character giant, and a character giant must have a giant-sized heart. I have a simple request of the audience. If you've been touched by one of his personal notes, received advice, support, or been inspired by his leadership, please offer your acknowledgement by raising your hand. I'm humbled to represent our collective family as we come together to honor Lewis Sr. Fortunately, I was born his nephew, which allowed me access and proximity to receive much advice and support. Most importantly, I have been one of his many understudies, and the responsibility of the understudy is to endeavor to live up. If living up is the mission, what legend and legacy do we have to live up to? First, we have to know who and what we are living up to and recognize that living up is not going to be easy and it will take a lifetime of dedication to the task. So let's talk values. We all understand that his values are centered on integrity. That integrity is surrounded by his virtue of humility and pride. I ask everyone in the audience, are you hip to that? Pride in all of his achievements and successes is a quiet pride, not a boastful pride. A pride which is crowned in gratitude and the deflection of credit to others that surround him. We witness that today. Since he rarely speaks of himself, let's talk performance. To start, he is the product of segregated schools, served his country in the army, among the first generation in the family to receive a university education at an integrated institution. I wasn't brave enough to call the name of that institution out. In terms of service, he served three boards, MI Homes, Huntington Bank Shares, and the Federal Reserve. He was on the I-670 Commission. He co-chaired the Columbus Community Relations Commission. Many of us in the industry know he was a pioneer and financer of the House bill that mandated set-aside contracts for minority businesses. In 1987, the Builders Exchange awarded him the Man of the Year Award. That went while he led a company for 41 years that built many notable projects. But in terms of performance tonight, time does not permit reciting an all-inclusive list. So let's flip to what he hasn't done. And as I search my mind's computer for an answer, the cursor read, no records found. It said, there is no information available for what he hasn't done. I expanded my search parameters to what could he have done but didn't, the top hit. He's never run for an elected office. And thankfully, we've had great elected officials some with us here tonight. Although when scanning the remaining results, I realized that in an unofficial capacity, he served Mayors Reinhardt, Washutka, Coleman, Ginther, council members from Hammond all the way to Hardin, county commissioners Brooks, Brown, and Boyce, and a governor or two, if you recall the names Celeste and Voinovich. But before I get myself in trouble for chronicling what he hasn't done, let me speak about his co-honoree. Kurt Moody is recognized for his penchant and skill as a design architect and is among the most accomplished architects nationally. We know for every architectural design that comes to life, there is always a builder. As associates, these co-honorees have 30 collaborations together. I personally believe this represents one of the longest standing 
undocumented partnerships between two African-American men who lead African-American-owned firms ever. It's a big deal. So I return to the question, how do we live up? This understudy is no fool. We packed the house. Will the Smoot team stand up? <laughs> Mac, can we have the words? One team. One goal. How do we live up? We're going to do it the Columbus way. It'll take all of us to live up to your legacy. Senior, we respect you, we love you, we are proud of you. Be assured as we move forward that Chip is in the script. Congratulations and thank you for being our legend and our legacy. For those who know me, you're in trouble because I'm a talker, but uh, I was given a time limit and I'll do my best. Um, because I know these two very well uh, and they're so humble, I thought it'd be my job tonight to actually do a, a little bit to embarrass them with some personal stories that you may not know um, about things that happen in their personal life. Um, because uh, Lewis Sr. is actually my neighbor for many years growing up uh, and obviously uh, I've known my dad my entire life. so. Um, <clears throat> First one about uh, Lewis Sr., so, um, and a little bit about my dad as well. So he's really big on the entrepreneurial spirit, you know, and giving all the stories, like, you know, when I was your age and all the things we used to do. And so uh, when we were, again, emphasis, little kids. Little, keep that in mind, little kids. Uh, got a snow day, and you know, dad's like, you know, show that entrepreneurial spirit, go around and, you know, uh, shovel your neighbor's um, uh, driveways, right? Um, <clears throat> So we said, okay, me and my brothers, we got it kind of up early in the morning because we weren't going to go to school, and we decided to go to um, Mr. Smoot's house to uh, shovel his driveway. Um, for those of you who've been to his house, uh, he's a very humble man, but he actually has a larger driveway than you would think. Um, <laughs> as my brothers and I learned, there was a reason why we didn't have school, and it wasn't just because of the snow, it was cold. Um, and I remember... I don't think we were out there more than five minutes. And again, you know, there's, there's three of us, you know, three moody boys. We were inside, and Mrs. Smoot is pouring us hot chocolate because we were freezing our tails off trying to <laughs> shovel his driveway. And by the time we got done, a snow truck had actually come through and paved his driveway. <laughs> and I still think he paid us. Um, and that's just the kind of person that he is. Um, but we learned a lot of valuable lessons, you know, from the contractor side is, uh, one, you don't take on the job, you can't finish. <laughs> you know, you need to be able to size those things right. So um, we never <laughs> did their driveway again. Um, so, uh, but that was, that was uh, one, of my, one of the fun memories of, uh, about Mr. and Mrs. Smoot. Uh, wonderful family. Um, and that's one of the things, too, just in general about them is, uh, obviously you hear a lot of things about their legacy and the things they do at work. But best believe, they actually are the same people. And I have to say, you know, my opinion, they're better people at home than they are at work. And I, I really wish that more of you got a chance to see that side of them. Um, but now it's my dad's turn to get a little bit um, of, of some of what I'm going to dish out. So he's got, a, he's got a really funny sense of humor. He's a very, very, um, very interesting guy. So I, I was in grad school working on my Ph.D., and I'm struggling, and I've heard all the stories. You've heard a few of the ones about what happened in school and things that he did, and it's just like, you gotta persevere, you know? <laughs> like, you know, and all these different things, and I'm having my trouble, and then my dad calls and says, Get David, David. I was like, yes. Guess what? I'm like, um, what? Um, I got my PhD before you did, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> And I was like, what? He's like, I got an honorary doctorate because, you know, he's, obviously he's done all these great things in his career and whatnot, and they're giving out degrees. And I was like, that doesn't count. He's like, yes, it does. <laughs> you know? 
So why don't you hurry up and get your degree and then you can catch up to me? So um, just, those are some of the things that my dad, you know, he loves stories. Oh my, and any, any of, if, if any of my brothers were here or, or cousins would tell you about, uh, you know, he, he's not a professor, but he can lecture. Um, so, and they were good lectures. Again, things that you really appreciate now looking back and particularly now having kids myself, it's just like, whoa. Uh, okay, what was that lecture that we got on the, yeah, you know, let me, I should have been taking notes because some of these things are just really, really valuable. But the, another story, I'll I try to just do one or two more. And I'll, I'll keep it brief, but um, you know he played basketball at Ohio State, right? Now, um, he had three boys who all thought um, they could play basketball too. Now, looking at me, I don't look like a basketball player, but we tried. And we would practice for hours. I mean, hours sitting out in our driveway, taking shots until we could muster up the courage to challenge my dad. It's like, all right. And he would ask, are you ready? And we were like, yeah, we've been practicing all day. Of course we're ready. He's like, are you sure? Do you need a little more time? And it's like, nope, we're ready. And we would play pig, horse, you name it. And it's like tears would fall down our eyes. He had come in cold, not taking a shot, nothing. Nothing but net. Nothing off the backboard. One leg. And we're sitting there. And we would try to rally together and encourage each other as brothers. And just like, somebody's got to take him down. <laughs> you know? um, but, but again, uh, the things that we always saw was a, is just a chance to see. You know, you hear about perseverance. You, you, you hear about a lot of different these characteristics and things. But we got a chance to see these things in action on a daily basis. I remember a time when we came from home from church and there was a man, um, as we were, you know, were driving somewhere, who was choking his, some woman. My dad stops the car, gets out, and has a conversation, talks to that man, you don't do those kinds of things. Not exactly the most highly recommended thing I would recommend you do, <laughs> particularly day days with guns and whatnot, but again, I got a chance to witness that as a child, as a young African-American male. Do you know what that does to your confidence? To instill that, hey, when you say something, you know, when you see something wrong, you do something about it, regardless of what the consequences might be to you. You know, so having that example, seeing that on a daily basis, you know, teaching me his time as well, and I can't tell you all the fishing stories because that's where I, you know, I would really embarrass him talking about some of his fishing stories. But, but as, as one of the sons, and I, it's unfortunate that all my brothers aren't going to be able to be here tonight, but one of the things that I just would like to say on their behalf is thank you for um, being a great dad. Thank you for setting an example of what a man is and just showing us how to be nice guys because you don't often get those kinds of things. You have a lot of people who are good and they're successful in their business. You see their personal life and it doesn't measure up. And to have that example my entire life of saying, this is how you do it and how you do it right. And on behalf of my brothers, we are so proud of you, Dad. We, we love you. Um, and again, I wish we could give you a thousand uh, uh, hours of applause for all the things that you've done in your life. But um, um, we just say we thank you, we love you, uh, and appreciate you. I'm so glad, uh, proud of you, all the things that you've done. Thank you very much, Mark and David. And that wraps this up. So again, congratulations. It's time to uh, give you your, present you with your awards and uh, get on with the evening. How about a round of applause for our honorees and Mark Corna, Louis Smoot, Bert Moody. We so appreciate you tonight. At this time, our next guest is on stage for a special tribute, spoken word, artist Malik Willoughby. Thank you. Such incredibly beautiful souls. Mr. Kurt J. Moody Sr. and Mr. Lewis R. Smoot Sr. When you wore a younger man's clothes, was the question ever posed, who 
Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Rewriting poems of dreams deferred to self-actualize shooting stars to construct, deconstruct, reconstruct. These two, these two servant kings juxtapose. We, we dark indigo kids wrestled with narratives of never being enough. These two kings grab history by the lies and called its bluff construct to make a form by combining or arranging parts or elements to build. We built the world with these hands way back, way back then. Remember when we constructed the world's very first universities at Timbuktu? Remember when? Remember when we erected kingdoms in Songhai, Malay, Aksum, Zimbabwe, Kush, Nubia, and on and on? Somehow history forgot who we are. Mr. Moody, Mr. Smoot, who? Who do you think you are? Rewriting poems of dreams deferred to self-actualize shooting stars and these two these two servant kings revealing our goal to deconstruct, destroy, demolish. Our, kings, our kingdoms fell, thy will be done. Our kings and chiefs bought into covert savagery marked by the worst crimes against humanity run. Our blueprints burned, our grand structures crumbled beneath history retold. And these two kings, these two kings revealing our goal as these two kings stand on the shoulders of our ancestors to fashion our blues into blueprints, rebranding chains and chain gangs to gold chain links around multi-million dollar complexes, facilities, high rises, stadiums, arenas to the modern day pyramid, Akhenaten would be proud. Reconstruction. In architectural conservation, it is related to the architectural concepts of restoration, repairing existing, rebuilding fabric and preservation, the prevention of further decay, wherein the most extensive form of reconstruction is creating a replica of a destroyed building, yet a destroyed culture, promises unkept, reconstruction which led to our demise, surprise. We grew stronger still under the weight of more lies. We seeds covered in dirt marred by Jim Crow lynchings, inching, inching us closer to liberation before death and Juneteenth is more than just a cookout, y'all. These two kings, these two kings reconstructed the culture of our highest selves. You kept the promise, deconstruct. To take apart or examine something in order to reveal the basis or composition, often within the intention of exposing biases, flaws, or inconsistencies, Elder Smoot. Elder Moody, deconstruct the myths from my childhood history books. The text which read Sub-Sahara Africa has made no, mod no major contributions to the modern world. All of the lies that say if you come from nothing, then well, we know better, but what better way than to show better? They show out, they show up, deconstruct the double takes, installing second looks, construct a product of ideology, history, or social circumstances to every black man child who never dreamed of building beyond Legos, who never dreamed of designing beyond Crayola in the color of brown, Poindexter, East High, Lyndon McKinley, Jesse Owen Stadium, Vern Rife, Central State University, Malcolm X College, Columbus State, Ohio State, Schottenstein Center, Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, and on, and I can go on. His Majesty Moody. His Majesty Smoot, who, who do you think you are? Rewriting poems of dreams deferred to self-actualize shooting stars, I am because you are. I give thanks for reminding the world what greatness looks like in the true hue of mahogany. Our unborn children will celebrate you for knowing who you are and redesigning and rebuilding yourselves when the former was not enough. You kept the promise to be our ancestors' wildest dreams, these two kings. Malik Willoughby, these two kings. These two kings. Thank you. Thank you. We're at the moment now where we present our honorees with their awards. We invite host committee co-chair Bob White to join Mark here at the podium. How do I follow that? Wow. Um, now you're the majesties. Uh, it's probably going to cost me a little, but... Uh, 
We've run over, and I'm not supposed to say much, so I won't. But uh, I have to say a little bit about Kurt. And uh, I remember watching him play basketball, and I'm glad he followed through with architecture. But uh, <laughs> it's... It, uh, Now, it's such an honor to be here tonight. Um, I'm not sure how I got here, but I'm, I'm very honored to be here to talk about Kurt and Lewis, if you're gonna talk about Lewis, but Lewis is a close friend also. Um, and uh, Kurt and I both started our companies within six months of each other. Um, Kurt's done a lot better than I, but uh, it, it's, Together, we've done over 54 different projects representing over 5 million square feet in, in central Ohio together, and we're working on some neat things coming up. So it, again, uh, everything that's been said is true about Kurt. He is the nicest person I know. Um, and I was gonna add that uh, he's my best friend who doesn't drink or swear, uh, but that's, that would be a small group anyway. So, uh, but um, it, it's, uh, with that, okay, I'm gonna read what I'm supposed to read here if I can find my glasses. Um, this is what our plaque reads. Uh, thank you, Curtis J. Moody, Sr., for your pioneering work in architecture and for the exceptional manner in which you founded and grew the largest African-American owned architectural firm in the nation, one that consistently garners national attention by promoting diversity by design. Congratulations on your many national awards for design and your work on several billion dollars of construction over a stellar 45 year career. I'm supposed to read this too, but I, I want to say real quickly, uh, it, it, it is exciting uh, to start our companies at the same time and do so much together and, and have fun doing it. And I look forward to more and more in that future, even though I'm older than you. Um, it's my distinct pleasure at this time to present the King Arts Complex 2019 Legends and Legacy Award to Curtis J. Moody. These two guys are uh, two of my idols, and as I said, it was truly an honor for me to be able to uh, share the stage with them tonight. And the plaque for uh, Sherman Smoot reads, the plaque reads, thank you, I mean Lewis, excuse me. Thank you, thank you Lewis Smoot Sr. for your leadership of the Smoot Corporation and your legacy of excellence and reputation for hard work and high standards. Smoot Construction is known for professionalism, quality and honesty, forging employee and client relationships that span decades. Thank you for your board service and community involvement, and congratulations on your many local and national honors and awards of distinction. It is my distinct pleasure to present the King Arts Complex 2019 Legends and Legacies Award to Lewis Smoot Sr. Congratulations to both of you tonight. We so appreciate all of you on this program. What stories we have heard tonight. What inspiration you have given us. We have some additional people who would like to congratulate these honorees. So please, we'd like you to direct your attention to our screen. Lewis and Kurt, congratulations on this wonderful award. 
Legends and Legacies defines the two of you. Congratulations, Kurt and Lewis. Kurt, I just think it's a total kick that you are now a legend. And Lewis, uh, I'm so happy you're getting this recognition uh, when I know you don't seek out this level of recognition. I can't think of anybody in our community, in the development and construction community, that's more deserving uh, than these, these two men. Congratulations, Kurt. Congratulations, Mr. Smith. This could not happen to two finer gentlemen. Hi, Lewis. I want to say congratulations on this honor. I've known you for over 23 years, and you've been a big inspiration to my career and to my life. Thank you very much, and congratulations. Lewis, congratulations. As the Bible says, you will bear fruit that will remain. That is so much the case for your legacy in this community on which we build and will continue to build a great community. Kurt, you are truly a legend and you truly have left a great legacy for others throughout the country as well as here in Columbus. You've earned this award, you deserve this award and I'm proud to be one of your friends who says to you, congratulations brother. Kurt, uh, congratulations on receiving the Legends and Legacies Award and I congratulate you for building a legacy even stronger in the buildings you have designed. Uh, that is a legacy of lives that you have changed. Senior, congratulations for this great honor. It is well, very well deserved, and I'm sure there are many more to come. Lewis, you are deserving of this award, more so than just about anybody I can think of. And the Bible says, show honor to whom honor is due. And you are certainly deserving of this award of all the many years that you have labored in this community. And I couldn't think of a better person to receive such an award. Lewis, we've been through a lot over the last 40 years. We've had a lot of ups, we've had a lot of downs. We've had a lot of great times. We've had a lot of challenging times. I, I feel very humbled that I'm honored to uh, be able to Congratulate you, Lewis, on this wonderful award. Congratulations. Thank you for allowing me 40 years to be able to work with you. Dad, congratulations on this award, very prestigious. Uh, Benita and Trey and I would just like to say, well deserved, and um, we're looking forward to you fixing dinner at the house soon. Lewis, you are phenomenal. It's been great working with you all of these years, and I can only see that great things are in your future. Thank you. Congratulations, Lewis, on your award, Legends and Legacy. Uh, you've definitely been a legend uh, in, in my life and in our family, corporate business, and you continue to build uh, the legacy that will be left for many of those to follow. There's going to be some big footsteps. Congratulations, Lewis. Congratulations, Uncle Lewis, for this uh, well-deserved honor. Um, I'd like to thank you for everything that you've done for me personally um, and uh, helping all of the leaders in our company. Um, a heartfelt congratulations again, um, and uh, thank you. Lewis Smoot Sr., congratulations. You and Jenny have left a landmark that will last forever. Thank you very much for all you have done. Kurt, congratulations. No one is more deserving than you to receive the 2019 Legends and Legacy Award. Way to go, my friend, and congratulations. They are legends. They are leaving a legacy. Another round of applause for Kurt Moody and Louis Smoot. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. We bring back to the stage now the hardworking CEO of the King Arts Complex, the King Arts Complex, Demetrius Neely. Round of applause for her. Thank you so much. Well, this has been a great evening. I hope you all have enjoyed it. I know the hour is late. I want to say something about our honorees, but Mr. Jerry Revish, I believe this may be his, one of his last community events before he retires in about in a month. In 40 days, yes. It, in it about might 40 be. days. 
So let's give it up to Jerry Ravish, the best in Columbus. Jerry's been in our, coming into our living rooms forever, and he is definitely the dean of news media, and we have been so blessed to have you help us out here with these Legends programs. Congratulations, Kurt. Congratulations, Lewis. So deserving. As we complete this evening, we wanted to tell you earlier, we gave them some, a pre, um, there was a pre-event ceremony in which they received gifts. Two of them, they're wearing around their necks. Our logo, part of our logo is kente cloth. And kente is a ceremonial cloth uh, worn in times of great importance in Africa, in Ghana. And this tonight was a night of great importance, so the appropriateness of the kente. We are going to ask you if you are staying to join us at the reception, which you will follow the slave ship through the slave ship to the music of Andrew Waters to the reception. Hope you can stay, but if not, Please be safe going home. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next year. <laughs>